Hello everyone. So I have a sleeping baby sitting next to me. I don't know how long he's going to stay asleep, but I have Rational Mail Volume 2. I'm going to try and get through this chapter, Burden of Performance, Chapter 9. And I want to talk about some of the ideas and concepts in here really quickly because it's a very, I, I like this chapter. It's a good chapter. And so I had a lot of fun reading this and um, I wanted to share some of my thoughts and impressions with you. Hopefully I can do all of this before he wakes up. Fingers crossed, wish me luck. Here goes. It's a very seductive temptation to think that a man can simply remove himself from the performance equation with regards to women. Like it or not, play it or not, as a man you will always be evaluated on your performance or the convincing perception of it. This was very interesting and I really, really liked this idea. He starts off the chapter talking about how men absolutely must perform in order to gain female attention um, and, and also in order to establish their own value within the context of a society a little bit. And it's, it's this very heavy, unfair kind of burden that's placed on men, but the thing he's talking about in this particular quote here is the idea that you can't not be playing that game. Because you are a man, you are performing, whether you are consciously performing or unconsciously performing, whether you're telling yourself, oh no, I'm not going to perform, or whether you're actively trying to perform, the fact of your existence as a man is your performance. And I thought that was a really interesting idea, and I'm going to kind of branch off and kind of elaborate on that idea a bit. People have asked me a lot of the time, you know, well, what if your husband wasn't rich? And I thought that was really funny, you know, it's like, well, he wasn't rich when I met him, he didn't have a lot of money, and I didn't care. Well, what if he wasn't handsome? Well, you know, say he had some sort of disfiguring accident, he'd still be him, I'd still love him. Well, what if he wasn't as smart as he used to be? What if that happened? It's like, well, I still love him, you know? Um, you know, but it's it's kind of funny because at that point we're talking about how he goes from being a, a hardworking, successful man who's also very handsome, who's also very intelligent to, you know, let's, let's just strip things away and see at what point you stop loving him. We've played that game. I've, I've had to, to converse with guys in the comments section about that. It's like, okay, so let's take away the money. All right, let's take that away. Let's strip away the good looks. Okay, we'll take that away. Let's take away the, the um, you know, the intelligence. Let's take that away. It's like, how much can you take away from a person before you don't actually have a person anymore? You have like a, a wax doll that's, you know, that hasn't have any, any clearly defining features. There comes a point at which a person's performed behaviors are so rooted in their personality, so much a part of who they are, that it's very, very difficult to realistically separate a person from the performed behaviors they enact. Like, you, you can't. There comes a point where you just can't. How do you know who a person is? Well, you only know what you see of their behaviors as they interact with the world around them. With you, with other people in their world, um, that's all you know of that person. When you talk to them, that's an interaction that they're having with the world external to themselves. So the only thing that we really, really know about one another is, apart from the physical, the purely physical, so our, 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 the color of our eyes, the color of our hair, the color of our skin, apart from those things, all that we know is how we perform. And that's, that's an issue for like, you hear these stories about people who marry someone and find out that the person they married was, you know, drastically different from what they thought they were getting in, you know, getting married to, um, you know, people who are like, you know, sociopathic monsters, you know, I had no idea he was such a twisted person until after them we got married. You hear those stories, but the truth is, and, and there's so many people who look at it as like, well, I would never fall for something like that. Maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't, but the thing is, all that you know of another person is their performance. Um, so when you go back to that idea of, I want someone to love me for me, how much of you is you? How much of you is the external performance that you're putting on for the world around you? And that's, 
That's an interesting question. I suppose you could say it's a philosophical question. You can sit around and ponder that for hours and hours. Um, but it's, it's, it's kind of a reasonable question to be asking, you know. It's very easy to say, I wish women would just love me for who I am. You know, there are many ways in which I look at it and say, well, I do love my husband for who he is. But is me saying that I love my husband for who he is, loving him for who he is the way that a lot of these guys on the internet that I've talked to, maybe possibly yourself as well, want to be loved for who you are? You know, I love my husband, and he and I were talking about this just recently, I love him because of who he is, the entirety of who he is, everything that I know about him, and I tried to know him as well as possible, um, his, his virtues as well as his flaws. And that's when you know a person for who they are. You, you see them performing these behaviors, some of those behaviors are very positive, some of them are very negative, and you take that in its entirety and say, do I love this? Yes, I do. Or maybe, no, I don't. You know, I, I, I love all these good things this person does, but, you know, I, I hate these bad things. I can't stand them. They secretly just turn me off. Um, do, you, do you really know that person? Do you really love that person? Well, if you can't stand them half the time, maybe not. Um, I, I, get, I get kind of... I don't really know how exactly to respond to some of these, these accusations that I don't necessarily really love my husband um, because I don't love him for who he is because women aren't capable of loving a person for who they are. And maybe that's, maybe that's me being a woman and maybe you guys with your own, um, your own perspective, your own um, vantage point in the world can kind of help flesh out this idea for me a little more clearly. But, I mean, there's, there's, there's the pieces of a person's performance that are a little bit far removed from themselves. Um, you know, I have a job. Does my job define me? If I get a job, um, you know, working at the Taco Bell down the road, which is a lovely little Taco Bell, and they occasionally have job openings, if I was to go there and ask for a job and get a job there, does it define me that I work as an employee at a Taco Bell? you know, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> it's, it's a job. Um, it's a performance, but is that the performance that defines who I am? You know, maybe, maybe not. What, what's the, what's the underlying meaning behind the performance? Am I just trying to boost my family's income to help my family out? Well, that's kind of cool. Or maybe it's, you know, I'm so uneducated and unsuccessful in my own life that I couldn't do better. Uh, there are multiple ways to interpret that performance. Um, I would I would argue if somebody is looking at it in that way. Um, I haven't had a job in like forever because I've been staying at home, having kids, lots of kids, just had another kid. Performance is performance is very important. I think it is important for women, but I know that it's extremely important for men. Women can kind of get by on physical beauty. It's like, I'm physically attractive. That's all you need. All you need is the appearance of youth, health, and physical, you know, attractiveness, symmetry, and, and you're good to go. As a man, it's much more performance-based. Um, attraction, societal value, like society doesn't necessarily need men as much as it needs women. And I don't mean that in the oh guys you're all expendable kind of sense I mean from a purely biological perspective if you have two uh, you know two different sexes two different genders and one of them can reproduce very very rapidly one night and you're done and then you can move on to the next partner and also you know reproduce with that partner and the other gender of course takes nine months to actually produce a single unit of offspring sometimes we get lucky and have twins but you know which of those are you going to need more of in order to produce a high number of offspring? Like you can produce pretty pretty high numbers of offspring with only one viable male. In order to produce any significant number of offspring with females, you need multiple females producing offspring. So societies tend to have this idea and it's unfortunate, but they do tend to have a a more dismissive view of men, 
particularly men who are not high performing. And I mean, it's, it's, it, I don't know a way around that. It's not necessarily a good thing. Um, everybody who is a male in any society wants to be a high performing male because a low performing male just, they're dregs. They're dregs in a society. It's not so good. It's not a good place for any person to be. And I don't, I don't have a magic wand to wave on that one. I don't have a magic solution for that one. But it is an observation that you can make and I don't know what to do about it. Try to be a high performing male, I guess. That's kind of, that's kind of the message I see a lot of guys giving to each other. Be an alpha, um, be a high performing male, establish a sense of value for yourself, perform because you must. Because the, the fact of your existence means that you're already on a stage. Performance is expected of you. Women's prerequisite character role, they expect men to perform changes as their own phases of maturity dictates, and their sexual market value can realistically demand for that phase. He's talking about, of course, the, the I want a sexy guy during my party years, and I want a, 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 a beta male provider during my older years when I start having kids. Um, I always think this is funny because I um, I picked a partner for myself at the peak of my party years. 23 is the number everybody's giving for like the very peak of your party years. Well, that's when I found my husband. Um, I very rapidly, like within a month of meeting him, decided I wanted to marry him, informed him that I wanted to marry him, and informed him that I was going to do everything that I could to be the kind of woman who would deserve a man like him. And uh, I've worked very hard to do everything I can to strengthen and build our relationship and be a good partner to him. And I mean, ultimately he married me, so that's good. Um, I wasn't just some crazy chick who met him and was like, hey, guess what, I'm gonna marry you. Um, but uh, I look at that and it's like, we've, we've been together for over a decade now. And as time has passed, regardless of my sexual market value, um, and regardless of my own maturity or immaturity, um, as my needs have changed, the role that he's played have changed. Um, you know, it's, it's very easy to just have, you know, kind of fun, sexy time when you're both young and, you know, and relatively unburdened. But then you start having kids and right away, you know, there's medical issues that need to be taken care of. I was, I was a, an exotic dancer. And so it was like, okay, well, I can't, I can't be going up on stage if I'm in a hospital. <laughs> I can't, uh, I can't be, be dancing around if I'm gaining weight because of pregnancy. Um, I'm rapidly losing my ability to perform my job, at least temporarily. And, you know, I'd, I'd recover from a pregnancy and I'd try to go back to work and I did do that, but it was like, it started becoming very unrealistic because somebody needed to stay at home with the kids and I had the, the bodily equipment to stay at home with the kids and feed them and care for them. And um, they're just, there's so many biological elements that really enable that very traditional lifestyle of, you know, woman stays at home, takes care of the kids, particularly when you have multiple kids. We have four kids now. Um, as of right now, he's so cute. Yay. <laughs> I've always wanted four kids. I finally got there. It's like, I don't ever want to be pregnant again. I'm, I'm tired of being pregnant. <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, as all that happens, it's not necessarily even about maturity. It's about practicality. Um, I become physically vulnerable. I'm currently physically very vulnerable. Um, I appreciate that he takes care of me. Like we've, we've partnered together in order to create or at least bring a new life into this world. And, and now we're both just trying to, trying to keep on top of everything. <laughs> and uh, that, that kind of does that kind of does create a situation where the more he can take care of me, the better it is because I'm not always particularly well equipped to take care of myself. You know, I can try and I can do everything that I can, but there are simply limitations to what I am capable of. 
The simple fact is that you must actually be your performance. It must be internalized. In truth, you already are that performance, whether you dictate and direct that, or you think you can forget it and hope your natural, undirected performance will be appreciated by women and others. This is what I was talking about with the, with the first quote I read. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful idea. I'm so happy that he wrote this down. And I don't know how many men who've read this book have actually paid attention to this idea. The idea that you are already on the stage the moment you're born. You're already performing. It's not a matter of, okay, I'm going to go make tau and I'm going to walk away. You can walk away, but that's part of your performance as well. If you're walking away and saying, you know what, I'm tired of chasing women, I'm going to get my own shit together, and I'm just not going to care about what women think for a while. You know, that can be very, that can be very healthy. If you have an unhealthy relationship with women, if you have unhealthy relationship patterns, and you want to just take a step away from all that, um, and get out of this, this, this cycle that you've been in and just work on you, you know, that's, that's the healthiest way to be MGTOW. And I see men doing that. And every single time I do, I like, it's healthy. That's healthy. Um, but then there are guys who are like, no, no, I'm just not going to play. I'm going to be big Tao. I see guys every once in a while who will, they'll ask me a question like about my opinion on something or about what I think about something. And when I answer them, they'll be like, ha ha, but I'm MGTOW, Tao. So I don't care what you think because you're a woman. And it's like, ah, all right, how old are you? Are you 14? Cause that's the level of maturity I'm seeing maybe a little bit lower than 14. Um, not very mature there, man. Like, why are you wasting my time? I, I see a lot of that. And it's like reeking of immaturity. You're not growing if you're doing that kind of stuff. You're not actually improving your own situation, your own life, your own vantage point in the world. And uh, I do see men who... I do see men who are not going MGTOW for healthy reasons. I see it a lot. I see a lot of it. And it's like, there is such a thing as healthy MGTOW and that guy over there isn't doing it. Um, and that's, that's not so good because you're still on the stage, you're still performing. It's still a performance. Your interaction with people in the world around you is part of that performance. Every single thing you do is part of that performance. Do you brush your teeth every day? You know, do you, do you avoid cavities and, and, um, oh goodness, what else is it called? Do you avoid like gum disease? Um, because you know, if you do that, that's part of your performance. If you, if you groom your body, if you bathe, if you shower, if you wash your hair, that's part of your performance. Do you have a job? Can you hold down a job? That's part of your performance. The job itself, eh, I mean, it's technically part of your performance, but I mean, the, the, the fact that you can function in society is part of your performance. The way you talk, the way you stand, everything you do, the interactions that you have with the world around you is part of your performance. Is it part of you? Well, I mean, and that's, that's another thing, like there's this whole, um, there's, there's this very critical view of, um, pickup artistry where it's like, you know, oh, well, you're just putting on an act. How much of your actions are you? Have you internalized your actions? Have you internalized your behaviors? Are they you or are you just faking it? Sometimes people fake it until they make it. These are things to be aware of. Women will never have the same requisites of performance for themselves for which they expect men to maintain of themselves. I'm sitting right here, man. I'm sitting right here. Okay. I know he's talking about women in general, and I know what he's talking about because I hear it from women every once in a while, but here's the thing. Like, I was watching a video, and it was it was one of the, the Fresh and Fit videos, and there was, um, you know, this girl. They asked her what she wanted in a man, and she had this massive laundry list of things she wanted in a man. He's got to be six feet tall. He's got to earn this much money. He's got to do this. He's got to do that. And then they asked her, well, what do you bring to the table? And she was like, well, you know... I'm a good companion. <laughs> and the thing that I thought was interesting, like somebody pointed it out to her, it's like, well, you have this giant list of things you want from a man. 
are you bringing any of those things to the table? And honestly, if someone had been talking to me, if I'd been sitting in her spot and someone had been talking to me and I said, you know, I want him to be, you know, relatively healthy and fit. I want him to be, you know, interesting and engaging. I want him to, to be intelligent. I'm just thinking of things off the top of my head. If I had said all those things and they asked me, well, why didn't you say that you have any of those things? I would have just looked at them and been like, I just took it for granted that if I want these things from somebody, I need to be providing these things in, in, in return. Like that was something my mom always taught me when I was little. Now my mom definitely had a, a healthy dose of feminism in her worldview. And so like she was the, she was the businesswoman type feminist. So boomer lady, short business haircut, shoulder pads. Um, she was the product of her generation. What can we say? But uh, she actually did have some decent, decent relationship advice every once in a while, even if it was a little bit tainted with feminism. And the thing she kept telling me is, you know, if you want something in a man, you go and be that thing yourself because that will attract a man who has these, these elements in him to you. And it's really nice to think that, you know, th this is kind of a feminist take on it, it's like, okay, well, if you want a man who's a high earner and a businessman and all this stuff, then you got to go out and enter the business world and be a high earner and get a job and chase that career. That's the feminist mindset. And um, obviously it doesn't work out. Men, men who are successful and competent and um, attractive are not necessarily attracted to women who are aggressive and competitive and challenging his authority and you know that's not necessarily what men want however if you want a smart man it helps if you're a smart woman if you want a well-educated man it helps if you can at least converse knowledgeably about the the things that he's interested in um, if you want someone who's responsible are you responsible? Because if you want a responsible man, you can't be, you know, you can't be a drug addict who's three months late on their rent. You have to, you, you have to bring something to the table as well. This was the message my mother gave to me and I thought it was good advice. And so I worked on myself. I tried to make myself an attractive potential partner to somebody that I would want to be with. And, you know, I originally I started doing all the things that I had been told to do because that's what you do when you're young. You do what you've been taught. And so I tried to do the virgin till marriage thing and I was doing that and I was doing that and I was having ridiculously poor luck with it because as much as society wants to tell women, oh, you know, if you stay a virgin until you get married, men like that. As much as you red pill guys would like to tell me that that's how it works. In practice, that theory does not always hold up particularly well. And that was what I discovered. It's like, there are so many men who it's like, okay, well, you're a 19 year old virgin and I, or 20 year old virgin or whatever, I'm, I'm dating you and this is nice and all, we've been on a few dates, you're not putting out for me, so I'm gonna move on to, to greener pastures. It's like, well, wait a minute, what about that whole, you wanna, you, you, you wanna marry a virgin? It's like, well, when I'm ready to marry, maybe I'll find you. It's like, I'm not gonna be there, man. <laughs> I'm not gonna wait around for your sorry ass while you're going porking every single other woman you can find. No, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna go look for some top shelf guy who wants me. Like, now and not 10 years from now. How stupid do you think I am? So then I changed my strategies around. I looked and it's like, well, if I can't successfully find an attractive mate by being a virgin, um, I need to figure out how to do this whole sexy thing. <laughs> I don't necessarily need to have sex with multiple partners because that's not attractive. I need to figure out how to be sexy. I need to figure out how to be seductive. And I'll try and lure a guy in with that. I mean, it worked for me. I'm not to say that it's going to work for other women. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for other women. Um, I had to be kind of out of the box in my thinking because I was in, um, I was I was encountering a lot of unique, um, obstacles in my dating life. Um, I didn't have good social skills. I've talked about that. I didn't have good health. My health was very damaged by the upbringing that I had and so I had to recover from all that. So I want you to imagine a shy 
slightly pudgy, socially awkward young woman who, you know, maybe has some potential but isn't necessarily much of a looker at that point in her life, who's also a raging prude. And um, I, I'm sorry, are any of you guys going for that? Please do not tell me that I don't have some burden of performance for, like, myself. I had to do a complete overhaul right here in order to find a partner. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Much of what constitutes a demonstration of higher value for men is casual and unintentional. In fact, the best, most genuine forms of demonstration of higher value are exhibited when a man doesn't realize he's actually performing in a way that demonstrates his higher value. Actually, yeah, this is extremely true, and this is a good tip for any of you guys who are looking for um, any kind of dating information. Uh, as fun as Reading Mystery Method was, and as entertaining as Reading Mystery Method was, this right here is actually really good advice. You be you, but, and again, this is all back to the performance. You're always on a stage, you're always performing when you interact with other human beings. It's always a performance to a certain extent, but you have to be yourself as well. If you can link up a high value performance with you, internalizing it, um, you know, that's the, as he was talking about earlier, but if you can do all that and you meet a woman and you're talking with her and interacting with her and you're demonstrating higher value just in the fact of your existence, um, you're not necessarily gonna know that. You're just being you. The performance is so part of who you are that she's going to like you for who you are. Um, I think women really struggle with that because men are like, well, why can't you like me for who I am? It's like, well, we do like you for who you are. Um, we don't necessarily extract your performance from who you are. Oops, we are running out of time, people. So yeah, um, the, the, the more you internalize that performance, uh, the more you realize that performance is a part of who you are and the more that you kind of just bring that all together, um, the more you, you kind of integrate it into your life, the more attractive you're going to be because when you go to a woman and you're talking with her, it's not like you're bragging to her about how cool you think you are. You're just being yourself and in the process of being yourself, she's going to pick up on the fact that you're cool. Um, that's how that works. And that's something that my husband did very beautifully when I met him. He was just a fascinating individual. He led a fascinating life. And he was telling me just kind of casually because he was talking with me. He just met me, he was talking with me. He wasn't trying to impress me. He wasn't trying to get laid. He didn't really care. He was just talking with me because he met me and he was new in town. He was getting to know people. And he was, he was an amazing human being. And it was like, oh wow, you know. And he was telling me about things he was interested in, things that he enjoyed. That's where the demonstration of higher value comes in. It's like, are you, oops, no, no, we can make it through this video, we can do it. <laughs> Maybe not. Anyway, oh, yeah, we're running out of time. Someone is very, very hungry, and luckily that was the last quote for this chapter. It was a fun chapter. I really enjoyed it. Um, I, I hope you guys all get a chance to read it. Like I've had a few people message me and say that they've enjoyed reading this book um, alongside these videos and, um, you know, watching the videos to get an interesting perspective on the book. So I, um, I, I'm happy to hear that. I'm glad that you guys are, are enjoying this and, and getting that out of these. Um, I look forward to making more videos. I don't know how regular my schedule is going to be with that because things are happening right now in my life. Oh, I gotta feed someone, so I will talk to you guys later. Um, and it's good to be back. <laughs>